we have a new president coming in, which means that all the instrumentality of the modern national security state will now be uh, at the hands and fingers of Donald Trump. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concern, anxiety about how he might use those instruments of state. Uh, I would argue they have not been used terribly, admirably up to now anyway. So uh, here to talk to us about uh, specifically the FBI incident, uh, James Comey and the letters about the emails prior to last week's election. Here to tell us about what we learned from that incident is Cora Courier. Cora Courier writes for uh, The Intercept. She's a journalist there. Her focus includes national security, foreign affairs, and human rights. The piece she wrote uh, before the election was entitled Amid Clinton Controversy, FBI Documents Show Why Americans Should Worry About Intelligence Gathering. So Cora, first of all, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. So I could paraphrase the, what you wrote in this article uh, since I got a lot of, out of it, but that would may perhaps be a little silly since you wrote it. Um, what was your main uh, thought in writing this? What was your main thesis? You know, there was uh, a lot of newfound attention on the FBI and the FBI's power when uh, Comey made the decision to wade into the election with this, uh, you know, just barely a week before with this announcement about about uh, the more Clinton emails. And, you know, suddenly a lot of people who had, um, uh, a lot of people were focused on the FBI, the FBI's potential to exert political influence, to use its power, its investigations uh, for political purposes. And there was a lot of um, calling back to the Hoover era, era the, under J. Edgar Hoover, when the FBI, uh, you know, really became a, um, a domestic political operation under under of Hoover's direction. And so when I was looking at, I, I've been working on a number of stories about the FBI and particularly about the FBI's use of informants about their domestic uh, intelligence gathering operations. And when I saw all these comparisons um, to Hoover, you know, what I think was missing from a lot of that conversation was the fact that in the name of counterterrorism, uh, since September 11th, we have given the FBI a tremendous amount of, of intelligence uh, power. We have, you know, the FBI has explicitly been transformed since 9-11 into uh, a domestic intelligence agency. It's not just a law enforcement agency anymore. And so I think that that was something that was, uh, that was missing from the, the conversation about the FBI's powers was that, you know, the idea that the FBI could um, be misusing its powers would not have been lost on a lot of Muslim communities in the United States, uh, would not have been lost on anti-war activists uh, in the or in the first, uh, you know, in the, the Bush under the Bush administration. You know, we already had a lot of examples of the FBI misusing its uh, its powers in a sort of politicized way, and and the documents that I that focused on in this in this article are internal FBI documents talking about how the FBI needs to, to just ramp up this kind of intelligence gathering, how it needs to ramp up its use of informants and human intelligence and keep itself uh, the, it, it actually can, talks about uh, rivalries with the CIA and DHS and other intelligence agencies. So they're really concerned with maintaining uh, this posture that they've, that they've gained since 9-11. Well, tell us what you mean. I think this is a critical point uh, and, and I think it underlies everything you just said, Cora Courier, but tell us what you mean when you say that the FBI went from being a law enforcement agency to being an intelligence agency. What are the primary differences? Well, you know, intelligence uh, doesn't have to be linked to a particular uh, criminal wrongdoing, right, a particular case. And, uh, you know, after 9-11, there was a lot of criticism of uh, you know the agent, the intelligence, the, what what was traditionally called the wall between you know, intelligence agencies and uh, and law enforcement, and the idea that people slip between the cracks of those two places. And so there was a movement, you know, in part there were some good reasons for it. There was there was a movement to break down that wall and to share information more broadly, um, and that has uh, just become the 
FBI Zemo since then. In, in 2008, there was a major uh, step with uh, the issuance of new, new guidelines from the Attorney General at the time, which really emphasized uh, the FBI's need to gather, share, retain information. Um, it, he explicitly said, you know, regardless of whether it, it furthers investigative objectives in a narrow or, or more immediate sense, right? The FBI was going to be part of the intelligence community. They were going to be collecting information on, say, you know, the Iranian government or the, um, you know, Somalia, the Somali civil war, right? Like broad intelligence requirements of the kind that we usually think of, you know, uh, the CIA or something doing, right? The FBI could use all of these tools that it used to have to, we used to be only allowed to use um, when it was tied, these tactics were sort of tied to trying to uncover a particular criminal um, right. issue. Now they have so, them uh, in order to do intelligence. So to do a, so the old model, you know, the law enforcement model, the one that we're all used to is a crimes committed, you investigate it. If you, if you need the FBI, if it comes under their, their uh, jurisdiction, then they're con investigating a crime. The difference, so the difference here is intelligence means they can gather information on anything they consider to be relevant to their mission, including potentially, I suppose, observing people or perhaps even... Uh, baiting people into uh, attempting to bait people into committing crimes, but in any case, gathering intelligence on people who have not committed a crime, right? Yeah, there's definitely um, you know intelligence gathering on on people who haven't committed crimes in the name of these broader uh, you know intelligence collection requirements, as they call them, and and you know I think they there are safeguards. You know they are not supposed to investigate or or you know collect intelligence on people on the basis of First Amendment protected activity on the on the basis of uh, race or religion or or um, you know they, there are limits and they are subject to some oversight but I think we've seen in the past where these lines get blurred pretty quickly um, like I said back in I think it was 2010 the Inspector General of the Justice Department looked into the ways that the FBI had justified looking into all these anti-war groups and all these political groups groups like PETA you know and Greenpeace. And, uh, you know, they had been able to construct uh, counterterrorism justifications for it that, that really didn't hold up when someone else looked at it. But the cultural and um, sort of, you know, the intelligence bias was such that, that they were able to make these justifications for why they needed to, to, to spy on them. And it's not just spying, Cora Courier. It is, uh, as you point out, sting operations as well. And I'm really concerned about the nature of these sting operations because i mean we've had a number of them not come through but we've really what are the implications or issues and then we'll get to political and then we'll get to trump but what are the implications when we have fbi agents who now also see their role as being an internal intelligence agency for the united states what happens if over and above that we also have them acting as in effect provocateurs suggesting going into mosques, for example, and trying to find uh, vulnerable people or, or, you know, I suppose a legitimate explanation would be, well, they're looking for terrorists. And so they say, hey, you want to commit an act of terrorism? And if somebody says, yes, they've done a good thing. But a lot of these cases, when they've come out, what it's really been is, you know, maybe a mentally unbalanced person or whatever. Uh, and to what extent does that cross the line from even an intelligence function, which should be controversial for the FBI, into something different altogether. Well, this has been one of the more controversial developments of the FBI in, in recent years, is this new emphasis on stings. And, you know, part of it, again, is a reaction to 9-11, uh, to counterterrorism, and to the idea that uh, the FBI cannot allow a you know, they, they have to be proactive, right, in uncovering um, terrorist plots that they are not trying to solve, you know, that they're, they're trying to prevent um, the next terror attack, not, um, you know, just react to one. And so, you know, there's a somewhat understandable impulse, I think, like you see in the aftermath of something like Orlando, the shooting in Orlando, or the attempted bombings in Chelsea, you know, there's a there's a rush to blame the FBI. Why didn't you look into this? Why didn't you catch this guy? And in fact, it's really, really difficult to predict when somebody's going to become uh, actually going to 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 go from being a, a you know an 
weirdo making statements online and actually doing something dangerous. Um, not many people actually make that leap, and it's really difficult to predict when they're going to. So you understand that they're in this, um, you know, there is pressure to uh, have a more proactive stance, but it does raise all kinds of issues because, as you said, a lot of the cases that have come out, um, you know, according to recent studies of, you know, the more than 100 ISIS-related prosecutions that have happened over the past two years, something like 60% of them involved informants or undercover employees. And that raises the question, were these people actually threats to the begin with, or did the FBI uh, make them into threats? And, and, you get, and in my opinion, Carl, you get into a kind of feedback loop too, where I don't see FBI agents as a rule going into far right organizations. Maybe they are, and I just haven't heard about it. But the same level of intensity after you've seen far writers, everybody from Tim McVeigh in the Oklahoma City bombing to much, many more recent incidents. Uh, there, so I think there's, you know, everybody talks about the fact, and we'll get to Donald Trump, but everybody talks about the fact that, you know, Trump could turn the FBI into, you know, an arm of uh, a political arm the way Hoover did. But, you know, I would argue, and I remember when I was in Latin America many years ago, they would talk about, in some countries, the political police. It was the term for the equivalent of the FBI, this fear that the FBI will become the political police. I would argue that even under Obama, uh, that this has continued, that there's been a, a, a political bent to the investigations, and um, and B, that, you know, certainly under, more so under Bush, perhaps, but that there was and has been investigation of peace groups that are, by definition, you know, Quaker groups and so on, whose only reason for being investigated was that they opposed the political policies of the government in power. Is that ex extreme on my part, or is that a reasonable statement, you think? Well, you know, I, again, like like I was saying, I, I think that the when those when it came out that there were investigations of of you know peace group the Quaker groups or the, the anti-war groups or like more recently that the FBI you know had improperly uh, spied on people protesting the Keystone pipeline you know there'll be these um, you know it often comes out because they did violate some guideline or something right you know they did violate uh, it did appear that they didn't have the necessary justification for looking on these people into these people and that it was the agents you know probably their political bias that made them that made them think that that they were worth investigating and i think that that's a factor in a lot of surveillance of muslim communities as well um, where you know there's a, a sort of broad brush assumption that people um, uh, must know something about terrorism and that is used to justify a lot of scrutiny of muslim communities in a way that as you said uh, you know, we don't look at entire churches because of a because there's a shooting by a Christian person, right? And so, um, there's definitely a double standard. There's definitely a lot of I think wiggle room in the way that the rules can be, um, you know, uh, interpreted or or, or uh, used retroactively or or ahead of time to justify different types of surveillance. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, for all, all that being said, you know, a um, Obama, you know, a, a, an Eric Holder, uh, Loretta Lynch Justice Department, right, did have, you know, there, were, there are some checks and balances against the FBI. They are, there are rules. They have hundreds of pages of rules um, that they need to, and forms they have to fill out and documentation and all these things, right, that are meant to, meant to prevent the Hoover era abuses. And, you know, whether or not those, um, you know, have, those are all internal rules, right? And and they are enforced by the attorney general. If you have a, um, and by the FBI uh, leadership, you know, if you don't have um, political pressure from your from your administration, like we, you may, they might not have under the Trump administration, or or they're getting different kinds of orders. We don't know how those, uh, you know, whether all those rules will go out the window or or just be flagrantly violated in the way they were in the early years of the Bush administration. We, you know, we just don't know. Is there any, uh, 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 you're absolutely right. I think, you know, it's, it's up to the attorney general, the justice department and the executive leadership uh, to enforce those rules. What's more uh, Republican Congress could suspend even those rules that are in place uh, or, or revoke them if it chose to. Um, are there, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, Trump uh, and uh, the people close to him on these issues, Rudy Giuliani, Newt Gingrich, and so on, 
have shown, or certainly rhetorically, uh, a very um, strong mannish, you know, attitude to the, these sorts of things. Uh, and I say man because they are men. But um, uh, is there any kind of uh, check and balance to this? Is uh, you know, uh, because it's a, I think to a lot of people, I don't know if you find it frightening, but I do, and I think a lot of people do as well, that we've already not had a uh, very uh, a good system of checks and balances on what I consider to be kind of police state-ish FBI abuses, and now we have Donald Trump coming in. Uh, and so two-part question, I guess. Well, let's start with, are you concerned, are you uh, pretty concerned too? Uh, yeah, about the, you know, what kind of, um, you know, what will become normal, what will become like I said, you know, we saw what was justified in the immediate years, uh, you know, the, the, the beginning of the Bush administration under this kind of emergency um, logic of the war on terror. We saw a lot of, um, you know, abuses of, of, you know, both stretching the rules and just ignoring them. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly think that that, that kind of, um, you know, cultural uh, problem could come, cultural problem could come back under a, under a, Trump administration. Um, you know, there are checks in the sense that uh, cases will get challenged. You know, I think lawyers are, I think uh, defense lawyers and, and civil liberties lawyers and uh, activists are gearing up and getting ready to, you know, um, to challenge uh, these things, these types of surveillance, you know, anything that's unlawful or anything that's based on someone just being Muslim or a particular political administration, uh, you know, affiliation. I think people are ready. Um, and, and the fact that everyone's, you know, on heightened alert for that um, might mean that we're more uh, quicker to, to react and to challenge than, than people were in the Bush years. Well, and, and you anticipated the second half of my question, which is, well, what are the checks and balances? And, of course, uh, good journalism is always a good check and balance, too. Uh, I will not be a total bummer. I guess I will point out that Bush will be pointing, I mean, Trump will be pointing a lot at the judges soon. But still, that is a check and balance. Journalism is a check and balance. And the ballot box, at least so far, is a check and balance as well. So Cora Courier, journalist for The Intercept, thanks for writing this piece, and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks so much for having me.